everybody, Jordan here, the PH is silent, and in this episode of the Saturday Morning D&D Show, we talk about Ravnica and altering encounters as a dungeon master. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Saturday Morning D&D Show. My name is Jordan, with a silent PH in the middle, and I am joined always by my wonderful co-host, Sir Lucian, over at Sir Lucian Gaming. Say hello, sir. Hello, and there is no silent letters in my name. It's just all out and loud. Very <laughs> out and loud. And I, oh, you know what? I did this the last time that we switched over. Uh -oh. I changed your Hi, name from Sir Lucian Gaming to uh, Simple and Keen. I'm simple and keen today, <laughs> but I would change that to be I'm complicated and what's the opposite of keen then? Uh, I indoors no in idea. there, he'll tell me. <laughs> what's the opposite of keen indoor? Give us something good. I see some good people in chat. I'm glad everybody's here. Skull Dixon's here. He's one of my D&D players right now in the Revenar campaign while you're fixing things. I see... Uh, my good buddy Cyberwolf is here. Indoor Adventurers here. Hello, Kika, Kika who is new. Hi. So hello yep. to you. Um, fantastic. Hello, yeah, uh, great to have you back, Lucian. We had a fun time with Indoor Adventure last week, but uh, glad that you're getting moved in to your new place, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. it's going to be awesome. Pretty soon, he's going to have a whole wall of stuff behind him. <laughs> It'll look like all the mess that's behind me. That I need to I've probably... got a custom poster coming that I think you're going to like because oh, it sweet. has some cool things in it that are Saturday morning Dungeons and Dragons related in some way. That sounds awesome. <laughs> um, I approve of this. So great. Well, if you're new to the show, uh, this is the Saturday morning D&D show. We're live on Twitch Saturday mornings. And then we also uh, upload to YouTube. And it's also a podcast that you can find. You just have to search Saturday morning D&D show. Um, and my name is Jordan and this is Sir Lucian and we just talk about Dungeons and Dragons and kind of the games that we play in. So uh, that's the format of the show. It's really kind of whatever is on our minds at the moment. And news wise, uh, have you heard about this creature codex by Cobalt Press? Yes, and everybody likes a lot of Cobalt Press stuff. They are a third-party company that does a lot of D&D extra stuff, mm -hmm. and it's quality. And this one I've been seeing a lot of people talk about. I'll let you jump in it because I know it was something you're super into, but it looks pretty good. No, it looks really good. And just to talk about Cobalt Press, like they've made a lot of really interesting stuff. Like They did um, a – is it like a – Oh, I have the PDF, but I forgot what I bought. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like uh, deep, different types of magic they've made. And they made like different schools of magic that you can you can be. And so um, all fifth edition compatible stuff. But if you, it made me think like if you wanted to do, um, if your players have the monster manual memorized or if they have the uh, player's handbook memorized and you want to like, create that sense of wonder that this is a, an evolving magical world that they don't know everything in, then mm -hmm. borrowing these spells from these third-party companies or borrowing these monsters from these third-party companies is a great way to do that. And not that my players have the monster manual memorized, but I've been having a lot of fun pulling monsters from Tome of Beasts, which is their first book. Uh, yeah. And I haven't bought Creature Codex because I was looking at all of the monsters that I have. I'm like, I've got Tome of Beasts, I've got the Monster Manual, I've got Volo's Guide, and I've got Mordekainen's Tome of Foes. I kind of feel like I have enough monsters to throw at my party, so I haven't actually picked up Creature's Codex. But I think maybe when I can find it on sale for like $40 rather than $50, I might pick it up just to add to the collection. Because there are some really cool monsters in it. One being that there is a Shark Bowl Ooze which is a yes. giant ooze monster that has a living shark on the inside. Um, so it, the monster, the ooze will pull you inside. And I love oozes as monsters. I just think they're really fun. But the ooze will pull you inside the like shark bowl. And then the shark will attack you from the inside. And it's yeah, just, cool. they just have funny, weird things. Um, I'll get into this later, but like in Tome of Beasts, there is a horde golem, which is like a golem made out of treasure. And I had my players fight this. Uh, in our last campaign and just like fun, tricky monsters like that. Like they came in and they're like, oh my gosh, piles of gold. And I'm like, and the gold attacks you. And it's amazing. But yeah. And was that, did you use one? You did a one shot for us. Um, were those the goblins that you used? Did they come from the Cobalt Press? The, no, the Alchemist Goblin? They came from Volo's from? Guide to Monsters. 
Oh, that was it. Those are the ones that were pulling weird stuff yep. out of their packs. Yep. And that's oh, from Volos. Okay. <laughs> I didn't even see that in Volos. How'd I miss that? <laughs> no, uh, that's a, those are fun. Those are fun monsters too. Yeah. Um, but they I did do, I noticed chat said they did deep magic was the one you were. That's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. Thank you. Indoor. Yeah. They do map packs. They do creature codexes, layers. Um, they just add lots of cool things that expand on a lot of cool D and D stuff that's out there, but then they pick something and they really expand in a different way in it. Um, and another, uh, like, I'm going to bring up something that's very similar to that with the Jetpack seven group, because they're doing some very similar stuff to that too. But yeah, Cobalt press is super cool. They even got their own, like D and D fit five E kind of has forgotten realms and they've been nurturing forgotten realms. Um, Kobold Press has their own world called Midgard that they've been like nurturing. Mm -hmm. So you could play a D and D game in Midgard. Excuse me, I got the hiccups. Uh, could play a D and D game in Midgard, uh, which I haven't really looked into it that much. But I mean, if you're again like you want to surprise your players, you're tired of the Forgotten Realms, though I don't know why you would be. But you're tired of the Forgotten Realms and you want to play in something else. Um, and Eberron isn't your fancy, then maybe check out some of these other stuff. But we, I really love Cobalt Press. Um, I've been using Tome of Beasts a lot, and they they just make some quality stuff, play tested stuff too. Like all of those yeah. monsters during the Kickstarter went out to people. People play tested them. They got the feedback. They tweaked everything before the final product came out. So it's not just like. Um, like it's a quality thing rather than just kind of a yeah. cash grab. Like we'll throw 5e on it and then we'll send it out there and make some money off of this book. Like they really wanted to make a good quality product with um, play tested monsters and stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Just look at their product page, 280 products, not going through the whole thing. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons, somewhere around 94 products mm -hmm. split up between some of the additions, but also doing some Pathfinder stuff. Midgard stuff, like you said, Sword and Wizardry. So though they are not sponsoring the show and we would love, <laughs> them, they are a great company. And we just always like to point out, these are the resources we use as DMs quite a bit. And um, it's always cool to you know see this other creativity stuff that's out there. They are really good. And they're kickstarting. They're finishing up our, um, they had just finished one of their kickstarters and I'm sure they'll be doing more because they like to do lots of kickstarters for their things too. So just keep an eye out for the Cobalt Press yeah. stuff because it's super cool. And then um, in other news, some friends of not necessarily Saturday morning D&D show, but friends of Forgotten Realms Explained, um, the uh, Absolute Tabletop group, they have uh, done a new Kickstarter and they're old. It's called uh, Shadows Over Drift Chapel. Um, and I will be honest, I don't know a ton about this other than I watched their little video on it. And it kind of seems like this weird, dark uh not campaign setting, but adventure. Um, but mm -hmm. they do kind of a a skeleton bone version. They call them adventure kits. So it's not necessarily a module that you would play through, um, but it's something that you can steal a bunch of stuff for for your own game. It's like a, it's a, an adventure kit. Or if you want to, you can expand upon what they've written and take that and uh, and run it as a module. And I have their first one called Oath of the Frozen King that was really good and really good maps Highly and yeah. like really polished, really awesome stuff. So Absolute Tabletop does some some really like kick-ass stuff. Um, and here I'll put a link in the chat. Yeah, um, yeah. Frozen yeah, King got a lot of a lot of stuff. A lot of hype. It's not a setting kit. They really call it an adventure kit because it is just like, here's an adventure, but you it's so modular that you can kind of take whatever you want from it and then, or you could run it as a module. Um, I don't know. It's 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 half and half. It's it's like mm -hmm. just kind of like, like Cobalt Press does this too. They have a book called Book of Lairs that's mm -hmm. just a bunch of, oh, like we're eighth level. Let me go to the eighth level section of Book of Lairs and here's like a, a one shot that you could run. It's kind of like that. Um, only it is like you could run this over three or four sessions or you could just be like, I want this dungeon for this or I want this mechanic for this or I want this NPC for this. Yeah, and here's like, a bunch of like modular pieces yeah. that you can then plug into what you're doing. And they all stick together like a Lego if you play them all yeah. out. Yeah, that's basically. a good analogy. Yeah. But they also work to where I just want, you know, block one, five, and seven. I'm going to put those in mine, mm -hmm. but I'm going to do something different for the other pieces. So they're really cool to be really modular and, and drop into your 
what you're already running, which could be great for like people running like something called Seeking Revenar, which is this huge thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, 100%. So uh, yeah, and you can go to absolutetabletop.com and they have like Oath of the Frozen King, their other one. You can order a PDF of that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they do print on demand. You'll have to check their website. But I have the yeah. PDF of Oath of the, for Oath of the Frozen King and it's it's really good art. It's really good fun. It's it's a it's a fun way to make a dungeon where you kind of like drop dice on a on a on a piece of paper and then from that piece of paper the dice kind of tell you okay uh, I, I dropped a four of a D6 on this. So that means that this room is going to be the fourth column on this table. So you kind of make it different every single time, uh, which is fun. So mm -hmm. yeah, you should definitely check out their stuff. Um, what else is happening, Lucian, in news? Well, Dungeons and Dragons, they're really kind of gearing up. Um, coming up pretty soon, their November is when they start doing some of their fundraiser stuff for Wizards of the Coast and Dungeons and Dragons. So they you've been seeing a lot of stuff where they talk about extra life. And with Extra Life, they have a Dungeons & Dragons team that you can go and sign up with, or you can donate to the different mm -hmm. team members, or even be one of the team members that's going to do streaming of gaming or playing of gaming, and people are going to sponsor you or, or give, you know donate money towards that. And they have these big, long lists of cool things. Um, one of the things that's been standing out to me Adventure League-wise is a couple of the people that are doing the Adventure League have goals in there that if he raises a certain amount of money you can have a character that can play legally in Adventure League with um, PHB plus two. Uh -huh. Normally the rule is you get PHB plus one extra resource, but this is a plus two. And there's like, he's going for something astronomical. Like if he says of his total donations from everything, from everybody helping him out, somehow reaches like $500,000, the whole next season, season nine, for every single player, anybody that wants to play it would be PHB plus two also. Now, he's pretty low on how much he's gotten donated so far, and it's already getting close to November. So I don't know if we'll make that. That might be a pie-in-the-sky kind of goal. But just imagine that where we have a whole season of two resources, how much that would change your character possibilities if you got to do two of the other resources instead of just one. Because I always feel a tiny bit limited, and I know it should be because you're trying to play these characters that are moving from campaign to campaign or game from game, week to week, DM to DM, uh, convention to convention. And you, you got to have some control of what's going on there. And the DM who's running it has to know what the heck are you playing? Oh, you're playing, you know, something from Volo's guide, but it's a, um, a Xanathar's class. And you want to add in a spell from, you know, uh, Sword, Sword Coast Sword Adventures Coast guide Adventure. or something. Yeah. So it starts to get crazy if you let everything in. So I understand why the rules are there, but that'd be kind of cool if we could have two. PhD no, for sure. And if people who follow me on Twitter, I was tweeting about um, that. I was rereading some of the dragon marked houses in Wayfinder's Guide to Eberron. And mm -hmm. there is a dragon marked dwarf house that allows you to have a dwarf that can get to 16 intelligence with um, standard array stuff or point by system. And so for Adventure League, that would be really cool. And I want to have, I want to make this transmuter wizard dwarf. Uh, but right there, I'm using the PHB and Wayfinder's Guide. So now I'm missing out on all of those Xanathar spells that yeah. are very elementally heavy. Like there are trans tran or, uh, transmutation spells in that book that I would like to have that I then couldn't. So yeah, it's one of those things like if you could just... I don't know, PHB plus two would solve a lot of problems for people that are more creative in their, in my, in their uh, character creation like I am. But it mm -hmm. also pushes people into that like metagaming kind of, um, yeah. uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Where uh, min maxer, min -maxer yeah. that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Those min maxer kind of people that are trying to really like, I want to be able to do this one thing as amazing as possible. And now that I can be a Duergar dwarf that is also a fighter that has these and these is. And with the new rules of Adventure League, you can get specific magic items. So that's cool. even the same thing is like those yeah. min-maxers are just kind of like going crazy, I'm sure. Well, I'd be interested to think because if, because there is Adventure League for Eberron, which was the next thing I was going to bring up as, as yeah. far as our news, is that there's going to be an Adventure League season uh, for Eberron, which is different than the Adventure League mm -hmm. season for the Forgotten Realms, the normal one. Um, so I wonder if in their rules, you get to use the Eberron book, you get to use PHB, then do you get plus one resource? I don't know. Or are they going to say 
only can use Eberron, only can use PHP, and we're going to leave it at that so that we can test out this, you know, because this is the first time they're doing that I, I can think of that their Adventure League is, is shifting into a whole other campaign setting. Yeah. I think. I don't think I've, I've heard it in any of the other not, ones. Not for point. 5e. It's all been Forgotten Realms for 5e yeah, until now. So but that will be very interesting. So maybe like, you'll get Think about board. it. I could play, like, I could play a Warforged whatever, or I could just play a human fighter that uses a racial feat, or I'll say an elven fighter that uses a racial feat from Xanathar's or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's PHB plus two right there, or plus one. So it kind of makes sense to me that they would say, well, no, if you're using Wayfinder's Guide, like if you're going to play a fighter, an Eberron Warforged fighter, then you're using Wayfinder's Guide resources, so it doesn't count. But I don't know. I haven't been to Adventure League in a while because I've been busy with other life stuff. That, well, and that's uh, all new for now because that stuff just came out. Oh, it just started? That Adventure League. Yeah, yeah. That So for the Eberron one. Like, in fact, the very first adventure which was the other piece of news i had for today was it has been released out on dm's guild it is called uh ddal -E elw00 you can look it up it's called what's past is prologue it's done by alan patrick somebody i've been in contact with hoping that we can get him on the show at some point to talk all things uh, adventure league um, and so he's written this the very first one so it's the official ddal -E elw00 just like all of the Forgotten Realms one have like a designator for all of their um, Adventure League adventures. Um, so it'd be interesting. So that's out. So obviously you can start playing as of now. It came out on Friday, I think, um, was the date that it hit DMs Guild. It might've been Thursday, Thursday or Friday. And uh, so they're kicking that off, which is very interesting. So we have two Adventure League kind of things going on. Yeah. I wonder, um, like, I guess the DM just has to show up and be like, no, I want to run an Eberron game as opposed to another game. And then you yeah, find well, players, yeah. but like, I'm thinking about Jordan, the player will go to adventure league and be like, I really want to play in this Eberron setting. And they'll be like, Oh, sorry. Those two tables are full because yeah. you, and so you can't play your Eberron character. You have to play your forgotten realms character, which then I have to bring two characters. And so I don't know how that would work, but yeah, it depends on what your game store is going to do. Yeah. And what DMS are showing up. And so it'd be interesting, interesting times as more stuff happens. Um, other than that, uh, there was pretty much the standard stuff. They've got no big um, streaming things going on. They've got several of their shows. They, I think they're building up for the November release because that's a pretty big month for releases for Wizards of the Coast again because right hot on the heels of um, Dragon Heist, we're going to have you know Dungeon of the, Ma uh, of the Mad Mage mm -hmm. coming in November. Also, we've got the Guild Master's Guide to Ravnica, We've got um, some other things that are happening right in those in that last of the year time frame before we get through November, December. And then we probably pretty soon, I bet in the next, in the November shows for Saturday morning D&D show, I bet we start, are able to start bringing you some news about what's going to be coming in 2019. Yeah. We're going to start seeing some of that stuff. So it'll be very interesting. So somebody so, asked me an interesting question the other yeah. day. They said, will... Uh, Ravnica do anything for D and D? Like, will it actually like? Will it be good? Will it be bad? Will it do anything at all? And I didn't really have a good answer, but I thought I'd prop or ask ask that question to you, um, because yeah. in my mind I'm like I don't really think it will because, like, I don't know if people are so Magic the Gathering lore heavy that they care about playing in a Magic the Gathering kind of world. Um, and, it, and we'll have to wait until this book comes out and actually look at it. But like the new races mm -hmm. and the new things in it, like I don't think a lot of people will care about. So it'll be kind of one of those books that dungeon masters buy because they're curious. But I don't think it's going to be a book that players will buy. And I just don't see it. I don't know, being as as popular as as it might be. Like, will it do anything for five E? Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, I think. I don't think it's going to change 5e overall, right? But the idea is it has the possibility to expand the player pool, which is probably the biggest reason that yeah. they're doing it. But I also can see there's definitely a group of D&D players that love character options. And it doesn't matter where those character options come from mm -hmm. because if we did if if they didn't really care that much, you wouldn't see all these third level uh third party uh, groups and press and and um, books being put out of 
that kind of stuff. Like if you go to drive through RPG or you go through a DMs guild, you'll find all kinds of extra subclasses, extra races, rules for playing this. And the only reason any of that stuff would exist is because there's people out there that really want to have this different type of character. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's this, there's definitely a group of people that love, Oh, I get new character options. I'm all in. Yeah. I think there's going to be a group of DMS that say this leans more towards the type of game I want to play. I kind of feel it's more of like an Eberron crowd mm -hmm. than it is, say, like a Dark Sun crowd or a Greyhawk crowd, right? So I think they could garner some of that kind of um, group. But I also wonder if we don't know how big it'll be. We, don't, we know the player base of Magic the Gathering is pretty big. Mm -hmm. Is there a group within that? There's probably plenty, like you said, that could care less about the actual lore that's going on they care about the mechanics of the card game and playing card games and tournament playing and building decks and all the cool stuff that goes with that right all the, that's what they're into they don't really care about the name on the card or the artwork that shows it but i have always been a huge fan of the artwork and the blurbs at the bottom of the card and mm -hmm. i've always wondered while i'm playing i was like what does this look like in real life if it wasn't just a card game, but it was a battle being played out? Mm -hmm. Or how how could we play something like this role play wise? That's not a card game because a card game's fast and things are happening and and going on. But what would this look like in a battle? And I'm I'm sure there's probably a segment of their community that's into that, and now they're going to have this outlet to say, well, what would happen if we we play Dungeons and Dragons, but we play it as if we're Magic the Gathering? you know sorcerers or planes planeswalkers yeah now this guild isn't quite that because it's still dungeons and dragons with a uh, a facade of another world right so it's basically another campaign book just like eberron is dungeons and dragons with a with a facade greyhawk is a dungeons and dragons with a facade forgotten realms is dungeons and dragons with a certain facade around it um so this is just going to see who is interested in those i am a huge fan i just don't know if there's 10 more fans like me if there's a thousand of them out there if there's millions more like me that are waiting for this i don't know is it going to change dungeons or dragons fifth edition at all i don't think so i don't think it's going to hurt it yeah i don't no. think having more products is going to detract from it i think um i think it'll be interesting i think the artwork we're going to get from it is going to be phenomenal um and i think if you're a company if me and you are are a company, you know, we have me and Jordan are doing Saturday morning D&D show and we decided to do something else. It It's not beyond the realm of possibility that you want those two things to interact. Yeah. Right. And they're both fantasy based. They're both magic based. They're both, you know, game based. They're both all of that. It, it, it just seems like a natural fit for some reason that it's taken them a really long time to get to. So, and I think it was probably the dream of Wizards of the Coast back in the day when they even bought it. Right. Because Back then, Dungeons & Dragons was really mostly going under at that point until a big company came by and bought, you know, the rights to it and started redoing all the stuff coming off of the TSR and all that stuff. So I think it'd be interesting. I think um, I can't wait for it. I hope there's more fans like me that love it. Being able to play a Loxodon, come on, that's going to be super cool. Um, what kind of spells are going to come out of it? Um, that kind of thing. Uh, what items and... Now, I don't know if I'm huge into Ravnica, another big city setting, because now we've had like three of them in a row. We've mm -hmm. got Waterdeep, Dragon Heist. We've got Eberron, which basically being right around, is it Sharn, I think is what it is? Yes. Sharn. And then, so that's kind of a big mega city. <clears throat> and which Wayfinder's getting... Guide had a big thing on Sharn in it, so. Yeah. Yeah, and so then the next one, so we've gotten three big mega city kind of stuff right in a row. So I think we'll be good on that. We're, I'm ready to see what we'll get after that because I think they've got that base covered. So, Well, Kika uh, in, in chat says that they are uh, got an upcoming Ravnica game soon um, and there are lots of players that are excited for it. So it's maybe it's just me that I'm like, I don't know the, the lore of Magic the Gathering, so I don't really care about this book as much, but there are people out there that are into it. So That's just because you're an Eberron fanboy. You just love Eberron. So that's my next thing is <laughs> why did Wizards of the Coast put all of this emphasis on, okay, why a physical book for Magic the Gathering world and why mm -hmm. a PDF for Eberron? I feel yeah. like those that should have been switched because uh, they've been releasing Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons, PDFs, 
as like, here's some free material kind of like whatever, um, to say, we're going to bundle that in a book as opposed to Eberron, which has like an established D and D fan base for it. Um, I don't know. It makes I thought that was interesting because I really feel like those should have been flop, flip flopped. Like yeah, the uh, timing yeah. feels weird here at the end of the year because if you if we were to go back and track timeline wise from January one to even right up until probably July, it was a pretty methodic schedule of released products, and then all of a sudden, right after that they just start dropping bombs left and right of all kinds of stuff. We're getting, you know, all these things that are coming out right at the end of the year. So it feels interesting to me, like they're, they're testing, I want to say, like they're doing a market test almost. And I think what they're doing with that is they're trying to gauge, are they ready to start jumping into other campaign books besides Forgotten Realms? Because if these just bomb out, are they going to take that as a reading from the community that says, hey, we don't really want those. We're, we're still cool with uh, Forgotten Realms. Just keep doing Forgotten Realms stuff. Yeah. Is that how they read that? Um, or, and another test is delivery. Can we get away from and can we make money from non-printed books, which is kind of the Eberron route at the moment? And I also almost feel like, I don't know, like, all those interviews you you've been kind of keeping up with the talks you listen to with Kevin Baker about, you know, Eberron and stuff. I still get this feeling though. They keep saying it's never there that there was some tension going on between those two parties of what Eberron should be. And yeah. that maybe delayed it longer when it could have come out sooner, but they never got past whatever that sticking point was so that could have been something we saw much earlier in the year. And it felt like it finally just got pushed to here, but then it got pushed right in the middle of all the other, inter you know, all, not interesting. I don't want to say other interesting as if it's not, I want to say all this other stuff that's happening at the end of the year. It finally, they got over whatever their sticking point was and they dropped it in. Now it's in this crowded area of products that have come out. Now what's going on, you know? So I wonder if it was because of some stuff we don't know in the background between them trying to figure out what Eberron and when to release Eberron. And, because they must be have been talking to themselves to say, when do we release another campaign setting? Yeah. Because there's just so many people bringing that conversation up and there's so many people that have their favorite. There's the Spelljammer crowd. There's the Dark Sun crowd. There's the Eberron crowd. You know, there's, there's all these different crowds of people. I'm Greyhawk. I'm huge Greyhawk. I'd love to see Dungeons and Dragons go back to Greyhawk. And that's been since you know advanced dungeons and dragons mm -hmm. see that. so there's all these different groups and we've all been saying where's this where this but they've been so super focused on forgotten realms right so and i love it i love forgotten realms don't get me wrong but it's interesting that this feels like the test phase or the marketing test the real-time test of is the community ready to jump campaign worlds and what type of products do they want? Because we've covered all the products they need, right? They've finally gotten out all the fifth edition books that a game needs. The player handbook is out. The monster manual book is out. Dungeon Dragons, uh, the, some supplements to those are out. So now what are the books that they need to move on to? Because they, they're not ready to do sixth edition. So they don't want to start thinking about, well, it's time to release sixth edition player's yeah. handbook or anything like that. So now they have to really figure it out. So that's my guess into what they're doing, you know? Um, and I feel like there's a crowded product release at the end here that feels a tiny bit haphazard, but I don't want to discourage on it. And I don't want to uh, say anything bad about it because I love the idea that there's so much stuff coming out mm -hmm. that we can pick and choose and grab the ones we like and just kind of, eh, I'll let that one go by that I don't need. And I'll pick this up, this one I, I do need or I do want. And I, and I have a lot of choice versus they decide oh everything bombed at the end of the year here nobody bought all the books because they're super mad about them releasing so many products and we go back to only having two books a year and i don't think people would be mad about them releasing too many products but i definitely you hit the nail on the head where consumers can be choosy at this point mm -hmm. so now that it's the end of the year and we have more or less three books dragon heist dungeon of the mad mage and ravnica and although ravnica is different from the other two um consumers can be picky you know they can be like well mm -hmm. i'm not gonna buy dungeon of the mad mage because i picked up this ravnica book and i really only have one set of 50 dollars to spend on D D books for the next like couple months so 
I don't know. I thought it was interesting because you know, I guess in my mind, from a business standpoint, Wizards of the Coast, Magic the Gathering makes a lot of sense to try and merge this. So maybe that's why they're like, we're going to put this in a book form and put all of our, our efforts into it, as opposed to Eberron, where we're going to put it into a PDF form. Because um, I just really, I don't know, it just felt like the two should have been flip-flopped, that the, the Magic the Gathering should have been the PDF and Eberron should have been the physical book. But if Eberron is successful as a PDF, they did say that they were going to make like some kind of a, not a print-on-demand of that, but an actual other Eberron book that they wanted to try and make to yeah. flush out and expand the lore even more. And then probably mm. put in, here are the stats for Warforged, here are the stats for uh, Dragonmarked, etc. So Yeah. Yeah, Eberron felt like the test to me. And, and we've talked about that before. Yeah. Like we thought it Guild was the Masters test. Ravica felt like a corporate strategic move. <laughs> and I, I'm I'm okay with it, but it felt like, you know, like their board of members said, Hey, we have these really you know, we own a Lego. Why don't we put a Lego adventure in here somewhere, you know, or whatever it could have been, whatever product they had. It just seems like those things should come together. Or um, you know, like if WizKids somehow owned some of these things, you know, like, because like with their, their, they do it with the, um, uh, what's the game? Hero Clicks. But they get all kinds of genres. It started mm. out with one genre and it might have been superhero and it might have been only one of the groups, might have been just Marvel based, but it expanded to everything. And so all of these different franchises can come in and then be part of that game. And what was that dice fighting game? There was a D&D &D version yeah. of that. There was a superhero version of that where you like yeah. you bought expansions that were dice and then you could like have cards and dice and stuff. Yeah, and we've right. seen they're expanding in other products because they released this the Dungeon Mayhem card game that was totally different and just kind of made off on, on a whim and they built it and it's out there. Um, they've, they've been doing a lot of board game stuff. So you can play a lot of those board games right now. Tomb of Annihilation had a board game. I'm sure probably eventually we'll probably see a dragon, uh, a water deep dragon heist, you know, board game at some Maybe. point where it's kind of leans into this. The online games are starting to pick up. Neverwinter is starting to use, I think they're doing Curse of Strahd right now over in Neverwinter online online and so these games they're they're really expanding their brand because i know they've seen the resurgence they're feeling the flush pockets of money that they're getting in from all their <laughs> products and it feels like we're moving back to that period where D, &D was super popular mm -hmm. which meant you started to, you you get a saturday morning cartoon all of a sudden you get breakfast cereals with it you get t-shirts and apparel with it you get you know, ev just anything and everything becomes D and D related, and we'll probably get to that oversaturation point, and we'll get to that point where we're like, okay, do we need a D and D toothbrush? Do we need, you know, uh, D and D water bottles? Uh, you know, just like it's going to go crazy. Yeah. But they're going to make their money. It'll happen, and then you know that's just how business works. <laughs> People yeah. Are there their money so <laughs> well cool so you've been moving so you probably don't have a yes. lot of dnd &D to talk about but like what's going on in your games or are you running stuff what's happening no no yeah yeah so everything's been focused on the move um i've been lurking over on my discord channel for the mega campaign that i launched dumbly several weeks before i was gonna move <laughs> um, and but it was just because there was so much player excitement going on with it that they that I just felt like I wanted to get it launched and going because um, everybody I told about it they were like well, I want to do this I'm ready to get into it my players are really ready to go so I just launched it and so they've had about a week off we've had no games but they're still super active in the Discord they're role playing in the tavern talking with each other interacting with each other challenging each other doing all kinds of stuff just offline which makes me super happy because it means that they're into the game, they're excited about the world, and they can't wait till we start getting games back. And I can't tell you really about what I did before, but I can tell you everything is going to be kicking off again. So we're going to have a Monday night game. We are going to have a Thursday night game. I'm going to go ahead and start posting up the schedule over on the Discord channel so that people can, the, the party leaders can try to vie for the Thursday slot. And with the end of September coming up, I'm probably only going to be able to run two games a week, but I'm going to make a big push when we get towards November, end of November, end of December to really ramp up the number of games I'm going to run to give a lot more people an opportunity to play. And for people that are from different time zones. So as far as um, European or Australian, we started getting some people signing up 
And so I want to make sure there's some dates in there, some times in there that they can also get their group out and play. So all of that's going to expand out even more over November and December as I begin to really ramp up this mega campaign. And anybody here in chat, if you want to play in it, you can sign up to it too. You can send me an email at seekingrevenor at gmail.com. Let me know you're interested and I can send you the information. And then you can also probably play in this too. I think we're up to something like 30 different players have signed up. Wow. We've got two or three groups are going on. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff going on. They're helping me build the world at the same time I'm doing some really cool stuff. The world is a forgotten realms ish with lots of homebrew thrown in and lots of products that come from other areas. I've got some stuff I grabbed from fourth edition. I've got some stuff I grabbed from AD and D. I got some stuff I've grabbed from third party groups. Um, and I put it in this area and I've tried to make it all cohesive and all this cool over arcing story and, and factions that are vying against each other. And the players are in this new world and they're just learning this information. They're very, they're just making the very first excursions into this unknown continent that's just been discovered as far as they can tell from the sword coast. So it's really cool. Lots of stuff's happening. I'm super excited about it just because of how excited mm -hmm. the players are. Um, so schedule starting back up. It's great to see people in Discord. Eventually, I want to find a place to copy and paste some of these stories that the players are writing. I might do a, like a blog site or something yeah. at some point when I get some time because they are super creative in their character backstories, their interactions with each other. Um, sometimes they do just like their thoughts in their mind or something while they're sitting mm -hmm. at the tavern and all these things are really cool just to sit there and read for a five or a 10 minute thing to say, Oh, what is Iravel doing? Or what is Sir Klaus doing? Or, you know, what is the monster squad doing? All these different cool characters and groups that are forming. So it's super cool. And I've got my real life friends are starting to jump in and, and jump in with the hype. I've got friends of the show from Saturday morning D&D show, even some just regular Jordan fans. I got a couple that said, hey, I heard of you just from Jordan and now I'm over here from the Forgotten Realms stuff. So we're, we're grabbing people from all over into this mega campaign, which is super cool. So I'm excited. Can't wait to play more games. I can't wait to play more than just Dungeons and Dragons also, though I have a lot planned for Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And, you know, so I'll be playing, I'm playing in two games, an Adventure League game, of Tomb of Annihilation. I'm also playing in a homebrew game at sitting at a table rolling physical dice, which is super fun. Um, and conventions will be coming up and we're gonna be doing all that stuff. So that's cool. That's where I'm at. Uh, if you have good ideas for Dungeons and Dragons decor, let me know <laughs> send it to me in, in the chat or you can send it to me in the comments of this video over on the Saturday Morning D&D Show YouTube channel. And because I want to get some poster stuff. Don't they have those uh, Illithid stuff. head mounts thing? You should get I one of those. <laughs> I need that for sure. Maybe a big dragon head coming yeah, out. Yeah, something cool crazy like that. Stuff. Something Send expensive. That That's what you need. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> something expensive. So I'm going to be doing that. I'm going to be getting the, um, the paint up, paint schemes up, and then the uh, uh, soundproofing so that I don't get as much echo in my brand yeah. new room that has hardly anything in it. So... It's going to be cool. And then when it's looking so cool, I bet what happens is Jordan does kind of a, a renovation of his room yeah. too. Once he sees how cool this is going to be, he's going to want to do his room too. So I might, I, I need to buy another monitor. And then I was looking at my desk. And so my entire thing might shift this way. And then the mm -hmm. camera will be pointing at like my Faerun map and various stuff that's over there. But, uh, I don't know when that'll happen. Uh, I think October I'm going to buy a new PC. So uh, as a birthday present to myself, which I tend to do every October. But A streaming PC, right? Or is it? <laughs> no, yeah. Like uh, a gaming, gaming PC. PC so that I can edit film yeah. or edit my videos better because it has to be able to edit all that stuff. And then um, it would be cool to have something that streams things really well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So that is what I have done, but um, I'm hoping Jordan got in a lot more Dungeons and Dragons than I did. Now, I did watch the Saturday morning D&D show. I was able to catch on, and oh, I want to say it was super cool to have an uh, indoor adventurer come in and, and hang out. I've got to talk to him quite a bit, but it was cool to see you guys interact and talk about your campaigns and 
um, and what he's running. He's running a lot of stuff yeah. just like I'm running. So it was a, it was a good fill in, which was super cool. Um, I watched some of the streams that were going on over the week. Um, I watched your game that you've been playing that I'm sure you'll talk a little bit about. Um, so all that, so I, I kind of kept in touch, but I mostly had a lurking week. Mm -hmm. Let's hope you had a real game playing week. Uh, How did yeah. your role playing go this week? Well, so a couple of things happened that I wanted to talk about. Um, my Sunday game they're they're still exploring this inverted pyramid. They're on level three of five, I believe. Yeah, one, two, three. Yeah, they found th and so and I was mentioning earlier they found like a uh, they fought a horde golem, which was really fun. And that monster had a really fun mechanic where he would go into a tornado and pull mm -hmm. magic items from the players and then oh, throw nice. them across the room. So some of them lost their weapons and had to like run across the room, grab their weapon and then run back. So it just created a cool dynamic. I, I ended up, that monster hit slow, but really hard. So I ended up taking down the paladin to zero health, which was fun. And um, I always think that my players are uh, fine. I'm like, no, you guys are fine. You have this. But e talking with them at the end, they're like, I thought this was the one that we were going to die. Like I had no idea. And I'm like, well, cool. Like that's the feeling you should have, I guess, rather than my perspective is I'm like, yeah, they got this. Like, it's not as difficult as I thought it was, or the dice were not, you know, I, I was rolling a hit and then a miss and a couple mm -hmm. misses and then a hit. So from my perspective, I'm like, yeah, he hits like a tank or he hits like a truck, but, uh, you guys are, you're not getting the full blow of everything that uh, he, yeah. he potentially could dish out. So that was really fun. Um, so now that they defeated this, this horde of treasure, I said like, here's the X amount of gold that you find. And it was like 25,000 gold. You can only really carry about 4,000 of that. I said out of here. So you're going to have to figure out a way of coordinating with the people on the surface to get all the gold out kind of a thing. And then I had them roll randomly on the, um, on the dungeon master's magic item oh, roll tables, that. because yes. I'm like, I wanted them to have like a magic item that they found by digging through all of this. But like, what do you get? And that yeah. kind of bit me in the butt because uh, one of my good. players rolled exceptionally <laughs> well, and he got a plus three long sword called yeah. defender. And defender yeah. is like, you can attack uh, and it's, so it's a plus three sword. So I could attack with plus three or I could attack with zero and add that plus three to my armor class for that for that round. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a really versatile sword and it's really cool. And I was just kind of like, man, I was like, maybe they'll get a plus two item. I could handle that. But like giving a plus three item this early felt broken. But also mm -hmm. I like the idea of kind of rolling randomly. So I don't know, should I have, uh, and the rest of them found various like powerful potions. Some of them, one of them found a piece of armor that was really good. Um, so it was balanced for the rest of the party, but for that one player, he got a really powerful sword. Should I have been like, here's the magic items you find and really like go out or rolling randomly is fun though. So I don't know. What I would think you have it's done? fun. Yeah. I think it's fun fine tuning. Cause like in some adventures or some campaigns, I'll fine tune so that you can get the right item to the right person. So it kind of yeah. makes sense and it makes them feel kind of good. And it, there's story reasons why they found it. Like the ranger found the cool bow that they, that makes them kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And that's cool. But I also love, I did in just my recent one at the very end of our last campaign, the pre-campaign where they found a treasure hoard. And I said, all right, you guys are going to dig through it. Get your dice out. I opened the dungeon master's guide right in front of everybody, right on the, right on mm -hmm. the camera and said, okay, John, roll your treasure so he got to roll it he got the dice and i'm flipping through it i'm gonna table this and yeah table this. i'm just like and you got this and you got that and you know like half of them got something like super cool a couple of them got something i was like oh i don't know about that but it was like but the randomness i think throws something into it that makes it feel fun yeah though i don't think i would do it on every single one it Correct. feels more like the one every fifth time or one every sixth time that feels fun to do but not all the time well and this felt like a perfect time to do it because they're actively searching in this mound of like treasure like what can they find because it's like jordan yeah. doesn't even know what's here so let's mm -hmm. just see what this with this uh, ancient wizard has accumulated kind of a thing so yeah i i, I won't cool. i don't regret it but mm -hmm. it will be interesting going forward to see how strong this particular player is with his new sword so yeah and I thought it was going back to one other point real quick before you move on. Um, I feel like 
as a dungeon master, I have been sharing that feeling, like you said, where we kind of are watching how an encounter unfolds. And we have one really idea of it is like, ah, oh, they've got this. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at where the hit points are because I know where the creature's hit points are. I'm seeing how many times they're hitting them. Maybe they're hitting three of the five times they're swinging. Like the math is running through my head. I'm just mm -hmm. like, yeah, somebody's going to get hit hard, but then somebody's going to get them back up and they're back up to full fighting ability again. And, and they're eventually, I could just tell like, okay, I think they've got this. And then after the whole session's done and I talked to one of the players, they're like, oh, I thought that was it. I thought that was TPK right there. And I, I just kept thinking, well, I mean, no, I, it didn't seem that way to me, but I had more information or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, it's funny to have that feeling where you think, oh my God, this is fine, but they are just like, this is the hardest thing we've ever had to do. <laughs> yeah. And then speaking of rolling randomly on stuff, rather than having it like pre-made, my Hot Springs Island game, all of my players are now level four and Ooh. I roll randomly for all the encounters. So we come to a new square. I roll randomly. I'm like, you know what? You found two zip birds and the, and it'll say in the encounter, like these zip birds are uh, aggressive or these zip birds are retreating from another enemy roll again. And you roll again on this other one. So they're kind of fighting. Um, and we had an entire night of really easy encounters because mm -hmm. of how I rolled randomly. And at the end of the night, I told my players, you know, like I might go through and, and make some more challenging stuff. Cause I know you guys were kind of like, well, really snakes again, Jordan. And I'm like, that's what I rolled. Mm -hmm. And sorry, we took out these snakes really easily. Nobody ever felt like they were in danger. Like the, the hot Springs Island felt very tame. So mm -hmm. I told them that. And then I went through the monster manual for hot Springs Island and I was looking and I'm like, well, I've got some like CR five and CR seven creatures in here. I just didn't roll poorly that night. I don't really think I should. I think I should continue with this randomly generated stuff and just kind of go with it. Maybe if I roll like another, like you find two snakes, I'll make it four snakes or something to kind of like make it a little mm -hmm. more difficult. But uh, I don't know. Like that was another thing where I'm like, I'm rolling randomly, but my players were kind of like, that was a really easy night. I'm like, but there are really difficult stuff in here you guys just got really lucky this this time around or lucky as in a relative term but yeah and that, that's the thing we fight right because the idea is if you're tailoring an adventure where everything they fight is always exactly the right level for them to overcome barely is that a little contrived because what world is that ever happening where only right. the exact challenge that you have the skills to meet is presented to you right it's never something super easy or it's never something so hard that everybody dies because that's not the type mm -hmm. we're always trying to build balanced encounters that they have just the right resources to, to overcome but in some ways i feel like we're that's artificial that's not a real breathing world. And I get that the Tomb of Annihilation has a little bit of this because you do a lot of random encounters in the jungles. But with the Hot Springs Island, I think it's the, it's the same way. They're trying to simulate an island. Yeah. And they're not trying to simulate a structured uh, narrative encounter base. So you're going to hit spots of boredom i think or spots of it was too easy and we did that same thing in tomb of annihilation where we hit these big runs of oh you guys you guys get to uh fight the raptors again you know the same one oh here's that same t-rex that you just fought yeah here's another one because of the way the random rolls come out but i think as players when i was playing that i never thought oh my DM is just lazy or my DM should do something differently. I always looked at it as a player, like cool, more XP and cool. Let's get through this. I don't have to worry so much about it. My character's not going to die today, mm -hmm. but we can keep going through and let's keep pushing deeper and pushing deeper to where we need to go. I think the thing that we could do as a, as a dungeon master. And I think when it would happen to me too, is that it challenges us to find a way to use the same creature interesting not change the creature right so i had an adventure i had a campaign it was called the black door campaign that had a lot of undead in it and my idea was is that they were going through this portal into a world that had been overrun by zombies so the basic full-on the zombie bite had happened it started spreading all over the world and now let's throw some dnd 
characters into that, what would happen. The problem is they're always fighting zombies because the whole world is zombies at this point. It's just zombies. So that would be like that same role coming up over and over. And I let my players down a little bit because I would be like, oh, okay, so it's eight more zombies. Here we go. Let's roll. Let's do our encounter of eight zombies. Oh, this time it was 10 zombies. Let's do that. And it got bogged down. And I felt like it was boring because I wasn't using them in a different way. I was using them the same way, even though I was they were the same creatures. What I think I should have done is found ways to use the same creature, but use them in cool different ways. Like one of the zombies groups could have been on fire for some reason because they walked through flammable mm -hmm. material and that maybe throws something a little bit different or these zombies are faster and more aggressive. So they, they come at you quicker or maybe they run from you or maybe there's some different things that I could do environment wise that I could add in also that makes that a more fun encounter, even though I'm still using the Dungeons and Dragons fifth edition zombie, you know, in yeah. five, six, seven different encounters. And on that note, it made me think like not just changing the monsters, but the environment. Like you could yeah. have, oh, the floor's crumbling away, or you could have, uh, if they're in a cave, maybe parts of the stalagmites or something are falling from the ceiling and you have to dodge out of those. So every once in yeah, a while, everybody has to make, yeah, yeah, there's lots of your, you know, yeah. Bad visibility all yeah. of a sudden. Yeah, Which, any of that could change that. Actually, it was really interesting. Uh, in Hot Springs Island, there was, I rolled randomly. And mm -hmm. part of the encounter was that there was a fog about four feet high that was coming off of a scalding hot uh, hot spring that was bubbling out. Oh, nice. Um, so there was a chance that they could fall into that. And then I rolled an encounter with boars. And I was like, oh, this is going to be fun. The boars are easy. But if they can't see the boars because the boars are in the fog, I'll have the boars like randomly like rush in and hit them and stuff like that. So I had all of these boars running in and, and attacking them. And then um, our cleric is a cleric of light, the light cleric. Is that what it is? And his channel divinity is just do radiant damage in a sphere mm -hmm. around him. Yeah. Um, and he ended up taking out like five out of the six boars with one hit. And I was like, well, that was supposed to be a really difficult campaign or a difficult fight. That was interesting because you couldn't see the boars. And now it's not because you guys have a, a way to bypass it. But still, he was really proud that he was able to do that. So it was kind of fun for him. Um, yeah. and, a, and a fun encounter overall because they were like, well, we we figured out the puzzle in a way. Um, mm -hmm. But using the environment like that, which kind of goes into um, what I was going to talk about finally, which is uh, the Saver Dice finale. So we had a yeah. Saver Dice finale. Um, really fun game. Uh, Dave was an excellent GM. We had like the world he created was really fun. All of the NPCs were really fun. We had a, we had a great time. Um, and I think this was also because of time like we had to finish on a certain amount of time because it's a it's a show and we have an ending time but uh the final battle did not feel like a final battle like we we finished the fight and then we were just like okay where's the boss because clearly mm -hmm. like that was just like the mini boss before the actual boss but that was it that was the final fight and uh that's another situation where it's like how could we have made that more interesting how could we have made that um environmentally maybe the walls were crumbling and we had to get out of there or something anything to make it feel like it had more urgency and stress uh but i think for time wise it was kind of like well we need to stop the fight here so that you guys can wrap up the story with the npcs before 7 30 mm -hmm. 7 45 hits yeah uh, yeah i think sometimes we are constrained if you're going to do a stream show yeah. and it's a limited session so you can do eight it's a mini campaign storyline you want to get through and it's rp heavy Mm -hmm. So you want to get, you want to provide those RP moments, but I think you're exactly right. The idea of, I feel like sometimes um, when running games, I get so deep into the mechanics, I forget about thinking about um, the structure of the adventure that we're having or the structure of the session we're having to add in a building uh, crescendo or building up to a climax that feels like there's something going on that the players are solving or there's there's some mm -hmm. type of danger that there's some type of time pressure and that allows them to have fun because they're trying to overcome that pressure that's building up right and so a lot of times i will build my encounter but i'm trying to remember all the mechanics of the creature i'm using or whatever's going on that i forget that i'm also need to be a director in some ways 
of in some ways like photography or, or of film or even the storyboard of how do you build this with those pieces that you have and then build the tension the right way so that it increases right at the right amount of time then they get to do something they do something cool they overcome it it's something they're going to talk about a lot later on mm -hmm. and then move on to the next thing to remember that it's not just the pieces but it's how you play them and in what order you play them and how you slow play certain things to start building how do you then ramp it up when you need to ramp it up so that you can get it all done in your session all while you're trying to keep an eye on time because yeah. every session has a you know not a, no session is infinitely timed so right. even if it's on on twitch or whatever it is you're going to play two three four five hours you still have an ending point so you have to keep that in mind so it's the juggling act of the dungeon master that we struggle with still yeah that that you <laughs> yeah. you get better at the more you play like i feel like the more yeah. you dm the more you'll learn like okay it has to kind of do this um and in that situation i think i think dave had plenty of monsters i think he had like really interesting monsters that were going to try and like mind control us and stuff like that. Like it was a fun fight, but we got a surprise round and I decided to just fireball. And I think the one thing that was like, Oh, I didn't think about that was that I put them all in a 20 foot room. So my mm -hmm. fireball hit everybody in that room and mm -hmm. took out over half of the monsters, like within a, like the weaker ones that took them all out. So they didn't even get a turn. So then it turned into, well, you've got like four monsters left. How do you, how do you get through these monsters? And so, yeah, I was thinking about it and I'm like, I don't know, maybe you just say, you know, they don't die. They go to one hit point to, to make it have that, that you still kind of have to figure out a way of getting through these, these eight monsters I've made rather than just four. Um, because, or it's going to cost you another spell slot, another fireball to take them out or something like that. Yeah. And it's, it, it kind of leads into this idea of what is your philosophy as a dungeon master to say, I've created an encounter, mm -hmm. but while we're playing it, it turned out who knows why just all awesome dice rolls easy. on the player's yeah, side, yeah. you know, all of a like, sudden it's too easy. Yeah. Should I make adjustments on the fly? Should reinforcements come rushing in that I didn't plan right. for reinforcements? Should, you know, like that, like what I just said, yeah. they actually go to one hit point. Yeah. Or is my philosophy that, no, I made this encounter a certain way and that's it. I'm sticking to my guns there. And it's arbitrary in the first place because I'm the one that made it in the first place. And I'm the one who designed the thing and the trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Am I building for a feeling? Am I building for a scene? Am I building for a mechanical outcome? You know, I think it really comes down to, and I've struggled a little bit too with, should I adjust things on the fly or should I let it lie as far as, you know, when I run an adventure, I'm still trying to figure that out myself, what I'm going to do as a DM. I, I've done both and I flip flop back and forth to see which one feels right to me. But, so, you know, and I still don't know if I've yeah. landed on the one that feels right to me yet. Maybe this is a good topic of conversation for our next show. And we can yes. like deep dive into that some more because it's something that like, I don't know, like, like, do you play by the rules that you've set because it is a game with rules or do you improvise it to try and make it more interesting? But then are you like hand holding your players in a way where you're like, well, they've already won, but I'm going to make them like suffer some more so that they feel like they really won. And, mm -hmm. and going back to, if your players have the monster manual memorized, then you know they kind of look at this and they're like that zombie should be dead like i know the rules or yeah or know? should they suffer if i made an encounter and didn't realize it was too tough yeah by accident like yeah. i didn't mean to do it i'm trying to build something that would be fun and challenging for them and then i made a mistake and start to see as it's playing out the tpk coming should i be doing something mm -hmm. should i make an adjustment or do I let it lay as it goes? You know, nope, that's how I created it. So that's yeah. how I'm going to run it. Yeah, and, and again, I created it. So I'm the one that's at fault in the first place. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, I think that could be a really good conversation to have from, from a DM standpoint of where you go and, and what to do, what, what feels right for you and your game that you're running. Yeah, and it might just be a case-by-case -case basis, but... Um, hey everybody, thanks for coming out to the Saturday morning DNG show and watching us live and listening to us uh, uh, as a podcast or watching us on YouTube. Uh, we love comments, so leave some comments on our YouTube channel. That's really great. Uh, and yeah, this was a really this was a good show. Like I had a lot of fun talking to you today, Mr. Lucian. Yeah, well, I was gone a week. Now yeah. I'm back a week. Now I'm looking over at Twitch while you're 
getting us out and i'm gonna look to see if there's somebody we can go raid real quick um i'm looking for the dungeons and dragons cool thing. now before we do take off though uh yep. next week we will not be having a show which is so so mm -hmm. sad um mm -hmm. i for sure will be gone and out of town so i just won't be able to stream lucian is like third 20 80 percent sure that he's not going to be here so yeah. odds are we won't have a show <laughs> Um, and it'll be, I think, the first time that we haven't had a show because both of our schedules just didn't work out to, like, stream something. Um, but it happens. So, you know, we made it 10 months, 9 months. <laughs> so don't blame us. But, yeah, we'll be back uh, not next week but the following week with another episode of the Saturday Morning D&D Show. So stay tuned with that. And it looks All like right. we're going to yeah. raid some people. Yeah, I'm going to do a raid. I just, I'm just i looking over here, and what this sounds just like an awesome one. How about Real Women of Gaming doing charities and champions? It looks like they're playing at a table, rolling some dice and all kinds of cool stuff. I mean, that just sounds fun to me. I'm going to type it in, get this thing going. We'll go over and just do a raid. Sure. Here it goes. Countdown's happening. Let's send some raiders over there and say hello to their channel. And uh, everybody, thanks for coming to the Saturday morning D&D show. Thank you guys show. so much. We'll see you in two weeks. Goodbye. Bye.